In this lecture, we're going to look at the molecules and compounds that are necessary for life. The first couple of things that I want to talk to you about are acids and bases. So those of you who have taken chemistry are familiar with the term acids and bases. And you know that acids generally describe anything that produces high levels of hydronium or hydrogen ions. And bases are those that produce hydroxide ions. Um, if you haven't taken chemistry, it's no big deal. The thing that's interesting about both of these is that when acids and bases get together, they produce water. That's one of the side effects. And the level of acid or base in the body is really important because it can have an effect on blood pressure. It can have an effect on breathing rate. So specifically, we're looking at acid and base levels within the blood. And we can internally monitor those levels. There are receptor cells all throughout the blood that are constantly looking at the level of acids and bases. We measure that level on a scale called the pH scale, and it runs from 0 to 14. Numbers at the low end of the scale, 0, 1, 2, 3, tend to be uh, chemicals that are acids. And those at the high end of the scale, 11, 12, 13, 14, tend to be basic chemicals or bases. Um, primarily, your body wants to stay right in the middle of the pH scale, right around 7 or slightly above. And so there are other chemicals all throughout your body that help to keep the pH level right in that neutral or midway zone. And those chemicals that help keep everything in balance are called buffers. They resist the change in pH. Um, all the other chemicals in the body tend to be classified in one of two ways. They're either called organic, which means they include two specific elements, both carbon and oxygen, or they are inorganic, which means they contain any of the other hundred and something elements from the periodic table, although really we're usually only dealing with about 12 different elements. And we'll talk more about those as we go. Um, the Another distinguishing feature between organic and inorganic are that organic molecules, when they break up or when they dissolve in water, they do not conduct electricity. That's uh, a term called non-electrolytes. Or inorganic, on the other hand, are really interesting because when they're added to water, they do break up into little charged particles, which means that they really easily conduct electricity, and that term is called electrolytes. Electricity is a very important characteristic of um, the nervous system, the way our nerves communicate, as well as our muscles. So it's important for our bodies to be able to conduct electricity. So here are some examples of the common inorganic substances in your body. Of course, water is a big one. Water is H2O. So this is a, a very important inorganic substance. It is 70% of all of the material in your cells, and it works as a lovely little environment for other chemical reactions to take place. Something else that water does, because it's in a liquid form in your body, there's no ice or steam inside you, all we have is liquid water, that very easily holds on to heat. It keeps your body temperature pretty balanced and it helps hold heat and it doesn't allow for big changes in temperature. The next um, inorganic substance that's important to you is oxygen and we pretty much always see this in um, pairs. Oxygen doesn't like to be on its own so it always tries to find a partner and oftentimes it just finds another oxygen as a partner so it's an O2. We use this for um, our metabolism for breaking down food and creating energy, and we get it most often through um, breathing in our lungs. Okay, the next couple, this one's gonna seem weird for a second. Carbon dioxide is the next one, which is CO2. Just a minute ago, I told you that organic substances have carbon and oxygen. CO2 has both of those things, but it is not considered organic. It is not considered a requirement of um, life or a chemical that our life processes are built on, and we'll explain that a little bit more later, but it's just one of the exceptions. There's almost always exceptions in life. 
So carbon dioxide comes into play in your body as a waste product of metabolism. So when oxygen and food get together and create energy, carbon dioxide is released as a part of that metabolism. It's extra stuff the body doesn't need, and so it gets breathed back out into the environment. The final inorganic substance that we're going to talk about right now are salts. These are That's a very generic term. It might be sodium chloride, which is a common one, table salt. It's found in your body in great um, amounts. But it might also be salts that include magnesium or potassium or any number of other um, basic metals from the periodic table. We use all of those for, again, muscle contraction and nerve communication because these are all, when they break up, they're all charged particles. And so they help to conduct electricity. Okay, let's talk a little bit about organic compounds. Hopefully all of these will sound familiar to you from when you studied biology. There are four organic compounds in your body that we are very concerned about. The first one is carbohydrates. So carbo refers to the fact that there's carbon. Hydrate, right? If you are hydrated, that means you've got water in your body. So carbohydrates have three compounds. They have carbon, they have hydrogen, and they have oxygen. Usually for every carbon, there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. And the that's the, the basic ratio. The importance of carbohydrates is to give your body energy and to give your body structural material. So um, the parts to make cell membranes, the parts to make DNA, the parts to make all kinds of things that your body needs in order to function. There are lots of different kinds of sugars. There are very simple sugars that are tiny little rings. They look kind of like um, a baseball diamond or a hexagon, or not a baseball diamond, but a baseball like the home plate, or a hexagon, but very simple little rings. These are called monosaccharides. There can be much bigger rings, which you can have two little chains together, which is called a disaccharide. Or if we combine these two and add it on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more, that would be a polysaccharide, many sugar chains. So some of the ones that you might have heard of are sucrose, that's table sugar, fructose, fruit sugar, glucose, that's animal sugar, it's the sugar that's found in your blood and in your body for energy. And starch are really, really big chains. That's a good example of a polysaccharide. Really, really big chains that you would find in bread or pasta, for example. Okay, the next compound uh, is called a lipid. This is a synonym of the word fat. So lipids are tend to be kind of slimy and greasy. And because of that fact, they do not dissolve in water. So think of a common fat like olive oil. If you pour it in water, it will just kind of bunch together and sit all on top of the water. It doesn't like to be with the water. Um, some lipids that you would find in your body are cholesterol, um, steroids. There are lots of steroids that are naturally occurring and good for you in the body. Um, we can talk about the kinds that are not necessarily so good for you. Um, a curious thing about lipids compared to um, carbohydrates is that they have the same elements. Look, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the exact same. The only difference is the ratio. So there tend to be fewer oxygens. Before I told you with carbohydrates, there, for every one oxygen, there'd be one carbon. And fats are not like that. There might be three or four carbons for every one oxygen. Um, the importance of fat is that it gives your body long-term energy. So it is stored, kind of like packed away for the winter. And then when you are low on calories or you are doing something that requires a, a lot of energy, say you're running a 10K or something, then that fat can help provide your body energy that it needs. Uh, the way fats are made is they have little chains, so it looks sort of like this. Little chains that have oxygens and hydrogens sticking out everywhere. And they have little small chains called fatty acids and, and small chains called glycerol. And these can combine to make 
medium-sized chains, very long chains of different kinds of fats. Um, so we'll talk more about this classification of saturated and unsaturated fats. Don't worry about that right now, but we can talk about it in class. Um, some other terms that you will hear that are examples of fats are phospholipids, which you might remember from biology if you remember your cell membrane structure, right? The term that we always use to describe that is phospholipid bilayer. You've got this little double-sided layer of what looks like I don't know, little alien heads with tails. And um, that's made up of this specific kind of fat called phospholipids. And then steroids I mentioned, and again, we can talk more about that in class. Okay, our third group of organic compounds are proteins. So proteins also have carbon. They also have oxygen. They also have hydrogen, but they must include nitrogen, which is the first time we've seen that in an organic compound and they sometimes include sulfur as well. So if you see nitrogen, you know you're dealing not with a carbohydrate or a fat. Proteins are incredibly important because they make up the entire structure of your body. The little tiny individual cells are made up of fats and sugars, but the big parts like hair, skin, muscle, um, all your organs, those are all made up of proteins. So Protein is, you know, the entire substance of who you are. And proteins have about 20 different amino acids. Think of these as little Lego blocks, right? You've got a red Lego block. You've got a blue Lego block. You've got a green Lego block. You've got a, I don't know, orangey yellow Lego block. Imagine that there are 20 different colors of Lego blocks, and depending on the way you arrange them, let's say maybe you have three red, three blue, one green, and nine yellows. You make a pattern there, and that pattern gives you one type of protein. If you change that ratio, and you have only one red, and two blue, and no greens, and four yellows, that would make a whole different protein. The little Legos don't change, it's just the combinations that change and those combinations give you the protein for hair or skin or fingernails or whatever. So, um, if, again, in chemistry, you may have talked a little bit about proteins um, in terms of their structure. So what we are concerned about is proteins have a specific shape and size, and because of that, we have to be really careful with the environment that they're in. This is one of the huge reasons why temperature matters so much in your body. If temperature gets too high or too low, then what happens is the proteins can lose their shape. And so if they lose their shape, that means they can no longer do their job. Their shape is incredibly important for the job that they do, whether they make your hair or whether they make your eye color or whether they make your liver. Remember I told you that structure determines function. So if the structure changes, if those Lego blocks get broken apart, then we call that denatured. That means that the protein no longer has its uh, the ability to do its job. So it's really important that we keep the environment very constant for proteins. Our last organic compound is nucleic acids, and there's only two examples. There's DNA and there's RNA. So again, you're probably getting used to this because we're dealing with organic compounds, so we know there's carbon, we know there's gonna be oxygen, we're getting really used to seeing hydrogen, now we see nitrogen again, and then we have another new one. We have phosphorus. Nucleic acids, again, also have little small building blocks, but instead of having 20, like the amino acids do, they only have four. They have an A, a T, a C, and a G. And again, I would imagine you have heard this in biology, and hopefully you even remember some of it. So each of these little building blocks is called a nucleotide. The nucleotides, when they are put into a certain sequence, they create oh, little things like humans, uh, you know, monkeys, mushrooms, 
everything else. The arrangement of these letters tells us whether you will be a human or a monkey or a banana or a cactus or whatever. And that order determines all of the features about you. It's pretty incredible. It's basically like a recipe for some kind of living thing. Within those nucleotides, you'll find a little sugar chain. It's usually one of the little five-sided um, chains. There's a little molecule called a phosphate group. Those of you who took chemistry probably remember that phosphate looks like that. And then there's a little base. So you basically get this little three-unit thing that looks like this. Um, and it just repeats over and over and over and over and over with different letters in each place. Okay, so where, where I'm going to leave you today is looking at um, DNA tells us what proteins to make. It's the recipe book for proteins. And those proteins, we know, based on the way that they're built, give us the physical characteristics of a person. Hair color, eye color, etc. Sometimes either the DNA gets damaged or the protein gets damaged. If it's a protein called a prion, it can cause all kinds of really significant diseases. Some examples are mad cow and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we are going to talk a lot more about that in class. But I just want you to have that information in the background and um, come into class with two or three clarifying questions or curiosity questions, and we will chat. Thanks.